I'm really excited about this upcoming panel. We definitely have a, a all-star stage of powerhouse here. Um, so really excited about what's to come. So thank you guys for joining. Um, I want to take a second just to introduce myself. My name is Desiree, uh, Desiree, last name Virgin. Um, like the island or whatever else you want to affiliate it with that helps you remember, but that's me. Um, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my background is I work with a ton of hotel owners. I work with the hotel owners associations and build out conferences, meetings, and events. And um, I just recently woke up one day, I listened to a podcast and I was like, well, I want to be in this. I want to learn more about AR, VR, and immersive reality. And so I decided to uh, just indulge and kind of just become a leech. So I'm a leech to all of you guys. And so I definitely appreciate all of you guys being in this space, looking forward to connecting with you. Um, so yeah, let's enjoy. Um, and here we have our stage panelists. I'm really excited. We have uh, uh, Colin Gallacher. We have James uh, Tuckpaw. Julio Karate and Russell Nicholson. Yes, and today we are doing robotic startups, academia, arts, and using XR tech, bringing research to the real world. All right, you guys enjoy. We'll do a Q&A at the end, so please, yeah, uh, write down some of your questions and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Hey, oh, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's uh, the last day, you know, it's a late, late uh, talk. So thanks for showing up and uh, hopefully it should be interesting to chat about stuff in robotics. There's been a few, you probably guys have seen like the spots walking around and some different um, robots. Um, so primarily with um, how robotics interact with uh, XR is really interesting. I mean, it, it, it's obviously digital twins getting like things virtual. That's the primary focus of like a lot of the people at the show here, not exclusively, but um, so, but how do you bring it back to the real world? Um, usually with like robots as like actors um, or doing something physical um, in real life. So we're, uh, we'll kind of jump in and in, in intro. So just really quick. Um, I'm Russell, I'm from Mass Robotics. We're a nonprofit co-working space um, in Boston that helps scale robotic startups. So it's the easy way I think we work, but like for robotics companies. Um, and uh, yeah, we do a lot of fun stuff. I do a little stuff in entertainment robots as well. But uh, I'll kind of have everybody give a quick intro background. So start with Julio. I'm, I'm Julio Corradi. I'm the, the fellow of AMD, uh, principal architect for the Industrial Vision Healthcare and Science uh, Division. So based in Germany, and uh, yeah, one my, one of my activities basically in robotics uh, and interacting with a lot of startups uh, in in this particular field. Hello, uh, my name is Colin Gallagher. I am a co-founder and president of uh, Haptics Robotics startup called Haply Robotics, and we specialize in um, building devices that bring the you know. Uh, manipulability of human hands um, into the digital uh, human computer interaction space. And so uh, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some of my experiences with you all. Hello, uh, my name is James Tukpa. I'm currently a PhD student at Northeastern University located in Boston, Massachusetts. I am also a researcher at the Robotic and Intelligent Vehicle Research Laboratory. Um, our goal is to focus on robotics and human in the loop interaction. And AR and VR comes into that with a understanding of what makes it easier to interact with robots, what makes it easier to understand how they're going to perform, how they are understanding the world around them. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that here now. Cool. Cool, cool. So, I mean, you guys gave a little hint at like some of the stuff you guys are working on. Um, what are specific projects that use like XR tech um, and bring robotics or like automation to the real world? Anybody can. Uh um, so one of the prize projects that we have at our lab is Avatar, and Avatar was part of the Expo Prize Challenge, um, and it was to develop a fully immersive robotic experience. And our goals is to bring in AR and XR into that um, project so that you can feel what the robot is doing, feel what the robot is performing, and that will help inform the user on how to interact with the world around them. So it is a teleoperative shared control system that allows the user in an AR environment to move, pick up, place, uh, and manipulate items as the robot itself so that they don't have to worry about trying to control it via other mechanisms or planning or processing. 
in, I would say in my case, I have many projects because we, we deal with the industry, but fundamentally, I would say we are dealing mostly with reactive systems in which uh, AR and XR are integrated with uh, physical systems, so it's a combination of the two, in a way that uh, the, any, any user that is dealing with, for example, a manufacturing machine that uh, has some automation and there are robots involved, is basically capable to not just stimulate the environment, but interact uh, with uh, this physical system. This basically introduces a couple of uh, additional elements that are uh, how the uh, AR, VXR is communicating with the machine. So means latency, means real times, means reactive system. So those are the problems that are of interest for the manufacturing industry in general. And uh, when you scale your problem from a single robot to a multiple robot, those are the things we are working on. We do use a particular type of technology that uh, is related to uh, improve the responsiveness uh, of such systems. Uh, is basically uh, creating a, a, or moving part of the system that are uh, simulated uh, within an AR, XR into, uh, into hardware in making those things uh, reacting extremely fast, I would say in timing like a nanosecond or microsecond, because that's what the, ultimately when you scale the problem to thousands of uh, machines, for example, is, 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 the, is the element that uh, matter most. Those are the type of things that we are doing in our, in our activity and links the two domains together. Um, for Haply, we are essentially an XR uh, display. Um, so you know, we're very familiar with audio displays and visual displays, and we've seen the emergence of, um, over the last five to 10 years, of some pretty impressive visual displays for augmented reality and mixed reality in VR. Um, but uh, what we do is we develop a touch display. It has its own uh, respective challenges, obviously associated with it in terms of the sensory perception, uh, paradigm that humans have so you know we talked about latency a second ago with uh, julio um and the same thing we have to confront that all the time where we're actually up on the boundaries of the laws of physics in terms of how quickly we can communicate um so millisecond latencies to run entire simulations and then be able to re render these back to have stable haptic interactions um this is the type of stuff that we're doing and we see this uh emerge in areas like surgical simulation um for example um, that's an area today where we have a, um, uh, you know, when you start to really try and integrate precision interaction and use the multimodal aspects of both sight, sound, and now the sense of touch to transfer these skills. Um, this is a this is kind of a new paradigm that's only been possible in the last few years with advances like what AMD is doing and graphics processing and this type of stuff. So, yeah, excellent. I mean, we were having a discussion actually before, like with digital twin, obviously it's like, you know, big, big word. And in robotics, we kind of I came to a consensus that it kind of means a little bit different. A lot of people, when they talk about digital twin, um, they'll say, you know, if you scan a room and you're like going to put a picture up and you want to see what the picture looks like digitally, it's like a one-time thing. There isn't like a time sensitive thing generally. And it's just like a rough um, estimate with robotics because you're usually using that data to like have a robot robot like move around or navigate it has to be pretty like um like updating a lot um and also like so you have to bring it virtual so having having you know if you're moving uh your arm using like a haply system and this is moving a robot arm like obviously your arm isn't as big or as small as a robot arm so it has to like kind of interpolate for that so um, there's a lot of interesting things. I'll just open up digital twin comments and what you guys think. Yeah, I would say, uh, as I said before, I mean, digital twin is uh, becoming a very important element that connects, uh, you know, the two domains. Uh, one is the domain of uh, simulating and creating things into a, a virtual uh, model. And the other one is the reality manufacturing machine, for example. I give you a, a quick example. You might have into a production line several machines that depend each other. Every machine has a, a certain throughput. Every machine has a certain number of sensors. Uh, every machine 
skin has a certain batches. Those batches could change along, I would say, the production time, the production line. And uh, what you are interested in is basically how can I adapt uh, my production system in function of the different uh, environmental changes? How can I detect anomalies uh, in my system ahead of time such that I could use uh, uh, information that are produced by such machines uh, in a way that I'm anticipating failures? Uh, what is going to happen uh, if I'm changing a recipe? Those elements uh, are basically uh, the, the challenges uh, uh, that uh, you have in the real world. So what you do, uh, you use a, a AR mechanism, you use an XR mechanism, you use a connectivity, so you get all the information out of sensor from the physical machine, you transfer that uh, into the virtual world, and you are able to create different scenarios. So those scenarios are used to optimize your process uh, and your production. Scenario is used to uh, detect the possible failures, uh, so creating different uh, environmental conditions, and those elements are fed back uh, into the machine. So uh, today, uh, the connection between uh, the digital model or the digital twin in the real system is becoming extremely important and much more important when you scale the problem. Instead of having one single machine, you have, for example, hundreds of them try to think about a production line for an automotive company. They have hundreds of those different robots that are basically coordinated each other. You have batches. This means that you have a different production line. You have different products that need to be managed. So the problem is really, really very large. So you use the virtual model and the virtual world fed by a specific real data creating the specific operations uh, or the specific, I would say, uh, new uh, environment and then you check if this environment is optimizing your system, if this environment is creating basically, uh, is adapting to your system and you feed back into the machine the optimized parameters. The other things that is very important is for example simulating some uh, safe condition or some safety conditions or simulating, uh, for example, uh, wearing or aging of, uh, you know, a fleet. Uh, I give you another example that we have in the automotive industry. Uh, when you design an engine, uh, this engine is designed based on certain, uh, you know, uh, um, concept, uh, a certain model. The engine then is basically tested uh, with, I don't know, a hundred uh, or a thousand uh, of different tests, but then you start the production and you produce millions of uh, uh, cars. So at this point, uh, uh, you might have after 10,000 uh, uh, cars that are produced, uh, you need to recall the cars because you have a problem. So this is the mechanism uh, using the digital twin and using the virtual model is a mechanism that links the two, you would say, uh, parts and then can allows you to scale the problem and to basically anticipate possible failures. So those are the elements that we see in the industry. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, you know, talk to a lot of people that are doing like filters and things and they're like, oh, cool, you, you know, we're using digital twin to like put like virtual makeup on and then like you talk to like certain companies in industry and they're like, we're using this to like control a thousand robots that are like doing really fast welding operations and things like this. So, and we have to monitor that. So, um, yeah, I want to ask James. So like wh how, where does academia play in like a lot of this kind of XR AR development and robotics specifically? So specifically, um, academia comes into the research side where it's it trying to expand, not for the sake of developing a product, but more for the sake of seeing what boundaries are actually present. Um, a lot of the research that's conducted, not just at Northeastern, but also at all universities, um, is seeing how we can apply these um, advancements in technology, XR, um, haptics responses in to what is a better medium for interacting and controlling robots, what's a better medium for understanding how they're going to perform, understanding um, and interacting and possibly controlling them from different areas. Um, one of the 
most recently discovered, one of the most seen in our lab is that it's a lot easier to cooperatively control using these mediums as opposed to teleoperative. Um, we talked about it earlier where latency is a major issue and trying to figure out ways around those, circumventing those issues, that's where academia comes in and stands uh, to gain the most, being able to see how we can tackle those problems or how we can circumvent those problems um, in a new and intuitive way. Excellent. Yeah, it, it's interesting thinking, you know, with latency and robotics, um, moving like arms and stuff, obviously, if you're interacting with people, it's safety concerns. And um, that's kind of an interesting view of where AI can come into play. So like when, you know, you lose connection, you know, something, you know, lightning storm happens, whatever, you lost connection, maybe AI, you know, on battery backup, of course, will <laughs> take over and say, okay, like, I'm not going to like, you know, continue an operation, but I can safely like, you know, guide the robot in a way that is not going to like cause a huge amount of harm. So, um, or any harm. Um, so yeah. So on the startup side with, with Happily, um, what, what kind of industry changes have you seen? Have you seen like hardware, some exciting new things that are like enabling hardware? I think you mentioned like in the past few years has been some great like sensor and research and things being done um, to kind of push forward what is capable. Um, can you talk about that? Colin. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sure. I mean, processing power is always really important. Um, this, I'm going to kind of loop together the digital twin uh, concept and how we see it, um, is often the simulation of uh, tissue. So the simulation of bone, muscle, fat, this type of thing inside of a procedure. And so that has its own um, set of uh, set of difficulties. Um, the sense of touch is not particularly well defined. This, the way that you can describe, you know, I'm looking at a monitor right here and you have RGB values and pixel counts and all these type of things. Um, in the sense of touch, you can't, even trying to communicate to somebody what a surface texture feels like is very difficult. Um, and so when we're modeling these tissues and we're doing all this stuff, there's a lot of like heuristics and things like this involved. Um, inevitably, there's uh, a lot of the progress that is we've seen in the last few years in the area of you know GPUs development. That's allowed us to run uh, faster simulation, uh, run larger simulation models um, uh, of these different tissue types and have them update in real time. And so that's something that's been really uh, transformative informative for us. And then, like I talked about before, the proliferation of 3D displays. What we are is a 3D mouse, right? That's effectively what we do, but we give you the sense of touch. And so as we're seeing this emergence of engineers, architects, game designers, doctors, soldiers, a lot of people manipulating, whether it's robots or simulation or 3D modeling software, um, a lot of people are interacting with content, digital content in 3D. And so that's where we're developing our, our platform to try and foresee that there are going to be opportunities to uh, facilitate that type of work. Awesome, awesome. So, and I'll kind of pose this next question um, to everybody. So what are... It's a two-part question. I'll say, what are like the challenges that you hit, like in terms of like software, hardware, whatever, um, and then also what's like some things that you really want or are looking forward to, hopefully happening. They don't even have to be like on the horizon in in robotics and XR in terms of, again hardware, software, something that can amplify what you're working on. Yeah, definitely one of the challenges that we are seeing is uh, response time and real time in all those those uh, systems. Uh, most of the time there is a curious fact. Uh, people are coming to us and say, oh, well, you know what? In simulation, our system works perfectly. When we deploy the system in reality, it doesn't work. How that's possible? So the, the point, I mean, the, the question, and the, the, this it seems really very simple, but the answer most of the time is pretty much complex. So what we do see, for example, is that there are assumptions that are uh, working perfectly into the virtual environment. Uh, things uh, are, you know, very fluid, uh, uh, very, very, very nice, uh, are definitely, uh, you know, connected with something that is local. Then you bring this particular system into reality and uh, you encounter noise, 
you encounter problems that are imperfections, uh, you encounter physical things that have been not modeled properly, you encounter thousands of uh, elements that are, pro for example, changing and are not fitting your model. And you encounter one of the biggest obstacles that is response time and uh, basically uh, real time. How we are solving these things? Uh, for example, we recently, you know, enabled our customers uh, in using a technology that could uh, transfer some software algorithm instead of being executed within a processing system, being executed into a hardware uh, platform. So we have a compiler that compiles code. This code is transferred into a set of, uh, you know, uh, gates. So it's basically executed uh, uh, with an extreme precision. Uh, so every clock cycle, for example, the system is executing an extraction extremely precise. And this, in, with this mechanism, we are able to react and properly, let's say, respond to the events instead of being engulfed in managing those elements with the processing system. The combination of those technology are giving the ability uh, to the virtual system to be mapped uh, into a physical system and uh, it being mapped with the control system that is capable to react properly. So the challenge, as I said, is matching the virtual part with the real part when you are connecting all together. Nice, nice. Um, so, Colin, any any things that you're like looking forward to help out your cause, what you're working on, or like also like again, software, hardware that and and things that are challenges and then could need some help. Latency is we talked about a little bit about that. So um, we've been working with Verizon um, uh, on some projects to try and. Um, have dedicated, you know, bandwidth to achieve latencies around one millisecond. Um, this is type of stuff that we're, it's not necessarily uh, ready today, but we're looking at probably in the next uh, 12 to 24 month kind of timelines to be able to test these things. Um, that's something that's really going to be really important for us. And this is this concept of mobile edge computing and being able to distribute these systems and communicate over hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of miles. I'm in the U.S., so I uh, should, uh, miles. Um, but uh, with the intention of being able to, to start running uh, haptics uh, simulation, or not simulation, but haptic control in real time. That's something that we're looking forward to. And then also just, uh, I don't know, I was walking the, the floor earlier today and there were things like, uh, the I got to look at the Sony 3D holographic display and that type of stuff is perfect for uh, manipulating 3D content. So that's very exciting. Nice. Yeah, I, I hope we can also, you know, we're always talking about like this uh, tech and it's like, man, the conference center Wi-Fi, you know, <laughs> small victories, right? So, and James, any like, like. Adding yes, there is there is a laundry list of items <laughs> uh, from a research standpoint that cause issues. Uh, one of the biggest uh, that we come across is the ability to process the information. So when you're trying to do the connectivity between XR, a, uh, AR, VR, and robotics, you have a lot of onboard computation that you're trying to do on the heads-up displays um, that doesn't really work with the way that the systems are currently designed. So you have to offload all of that computational ability, but then you also have to account for the computation that the robot is trying to perform for any given situation. So finding a way to distribute that, the computational load is a big issue that we have or that we currently face, as well as to, to the point that they, broke, that they both brought up, uh, the latency for that, transferring that information directly from a headset, giving that all of that processing in real time without degradating the information or delaying the information that you're getting um, to a point that it's too late to actually respond to it is a major issue. Um, so advancements that we are really looking forward to is a way to respond to these issues, a way to um, offload some of that computational um, load without basically removing the integrity of the real-time aspect of it. Interesting. That's, I mean, with... Um with uh i i keep thinking about uh, all this stuff with like ai and and just how it's developing but like having ai be more you know predictive language but like doing predictive uh like expectation of that data which i mean it could get kind of wild but like 
if it like buffers and helps latency at the other end because i know a lot of like um throughput is is being like for the processing is like okay well this is the data stream this is what we get but it's like <laughs> if you're like meeting it with the expected data stream which i i don't know if that's being done i don't know if anybody knows that if that's already being done but if it isn't there you go like, go go to the investors with that one it's a free one uh, so any, um, I'd just like to ask the panel to, uh, we'll open it up for like Q&A in a little bit, um, but like any like other things you want to yell out or scream out or talk about? Honestly, uh, I would uh, instead try to ask to the audience, I mean, if they do see the same challenge that we are seeing, because probably we are in the forefront of all those type of, uh, you know, uh, manifestations uh, and... Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just curious to see if the audience they they see the same the same applications between you know uh, AR XR in robotics uh, and uh, you ever hit any of those challenges because we, as I said we are seeing those in the industry pretty much. Yeah, it's really the, I just love this panel because like again we have like industry startups and academia which is like just the gamut of like you know people working on robotics things and XR and AR things so any volunteer for a question anybody yeah, this might come in yeah, go. Hi, I have a question um, James mentioned in the beginning of the, the panel about feeling um, using XR um, so I have questions beyond haptics what are some considerations that an interaction designer should have when designing interfaces for robotics XR interfaces for robotics hmm um for clarification you want to you want to have like a realistic response from the robot that you're interacting with correct uh that's correct yeah i was okay. just thinking as, as a designer what would you take into account when designing these xr interfaces for robots that might be different than designing an xr interface for an xr um so interestingly enough one of the projects that we also worked on in the lab was a comparative interface model um between what was traditionally utilized which is uh, a 2d interface uh with sliders and buttons for controlling it and a more um, responsive vr interface and so what we accounted for inside of that interface development was what was most intuitive for the user um what made them feel more realistic so we enabled them to visualize directly through the robots uh, through the robots cameras and through their lenses um, we gave them the ability to manipulate and move around in the same space as the robot um, there was haptic feedback in the controllers but that was more so when you responded to an error or when you were picking an item up more so to get that interactive responsiveness we try to um, provide them with the same experience that the robot was having, how it moved through the environment. We constrained it so that they couldn't uh, walk around as if they were themselves, but as if they were the robot. Um, so the way that I would suggest incorporating that interactivity into the development process is determining what are the constraints that your robot has and how can you impart that on the user so that they can better understand how to interact or how to control the robot because the way that it comes for developers we are thinking about it how we will respond in the situation not the constraints that the device we're trying to control has and it's a lot easier once the user understands those constraints because that'll inform them how they should be thinking about solving the problems that they're trying to solve yeah, I can like just add to that too. Like, um, I, one of the things I noticed, and and I've dealt with like robotics and presenting robots, like for I many years, I used to work at SoftBank Robotics, like Pepper, and now maybe if some people might know, but like the 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 kind of there's a big wow factor obviously like you see the spot walking around oh this is so cool i want to take a video um and then you know it's cool but then if it's hanging around in the lobby like it's like okay this is cool but like i've seen it i have a video and they're like it's move on so it's it's a mix of like almost an roi so client like what what am i getting what am i providing um but then also kind of adding further content and further I don't know things in a way so it's not just like a one trick pony essentially so you know and and that's quite difficult with robotics um because a lot of times it's a very passing like hey 90 second interaction this is great and that's fine um but 
with with that you you know again it's like when you boil it down what is the value of this what am i giving the client i know like I've seen a few like the chat GPT uh, like hologram faces and like projects like that, which are great. But, and again, it's like, okay, you have an Alexa, which has function of like a clock or like, you know, gives you basic weather information. Um, but if you have a personality that's in your house or something as a character, that's fun. Great. Everybody loves it. Well, most people do, but uh, um, but like what what like if I'm paying monthly for this or I'm paying for this, what is the what's the return rate? So um, and a lot of you know it, it's an awkward question. I don't have an answer for it yet. Socially, it's like an interesting uh, thing to like dive into. So I won't like go too deep in there. But like it's it is a product with robotics, especially like robots that have um, more humanoid or more like character aspects um, or characters like virtual characters it's like the implication of like how long is that interaction should you feel bad if you move on from it <laughs> should you um, you know how should you treat that and I think a lot of a lot of companies are moving to just like yeah yeah you'd fall in love with your robot cat um, but there's like implications with like human behavior around that again whole can of worms I won't go too down that yeah, <laughs> but, but I sure. would definitely say that uh, we need to distinguish between entertaining and uh, operating things uh, into into a proper safe way so uh, when you design the user interface one of the things that is important is is the process or are the steps of this user interface when you know are applied by the operator uh, safe enough are the system capable to anticipate possible uh, you know uh, operation that are violating a safety 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 constraints so you are moving this robot uh, is teleoperated uh, and uh, you have no control maybe sometimes even no visibility so all the operations should be taken into account in a way that you are protecting the the environment and the robot itself i mean you don't want it to say oops i just killed someone that was passing by so and, and those are very difficult challenges because it requires a combination of you know sensing the environment as well as design your user interface in a way that uh, let's say has some protection intrinsic protection to avoid the such circumstances so that is a, is a very difficult problem extremely difficult problem today cool any more questions? We can we can probably chat about just general stuff too in robotics. So, if you have broad questions about ro robotics, if anybody on the panel also, if you have stuff you want to, you I have a stage. <laughs> actually, I had a question for Colin. If you guys have done any haptic on haptic responsiveness or interaction, because I know in our lab one of the things that we try is robot to robot interactions. So I was curious to see if, because um, the avatar is basically structured as two arms that can interact with each other. So have you co coordinated like two haptic responses and seeing what the feedback like that is? So is the question related to tele like teleoperation yeah, or related okay. to teleoperation. yeah absolutely um, so yes um, we've connected uh, robots to either other robots um, have them interact with physical environments um, interact with um, other uh, other systems that are uh, you know you can even connect two haptic robots and have them shake hands or do these type of things um, there is a special a special stability and this comes into safety and usability and user experience design stability and haptics is a is a major theme um, where you don't you don't want to inject energy into a system where it starts to go unstable and starts to shake and these type of things it makes the user experience really really poor and that you don't trust the robot that you're interacting with um, and so these are these type of things where um, what we're doing as a company are starting to integrate certain aspects of um, predictive uh, instability based on vibration, um, these type of things. So leveraging uh, different machine learning models and things like this to improve the user experience from a haptic perspective so that you have a better trust in your robot that it's not going to, um, you know, the last thing you want is, and there's a reason why like intuitive surgical, um, uh, the current Da Vinci systems don't necessarily have haptic um, uh, in them is uh, well I'm not going to speak to their their exact reason but um, I would presume that a lot of it has to do with safety and you want to ensure that your devices are not going to go unstable and shake and do these type of things so 
safety is general uh, because it's, I mean, uh, anything that has to do with medical application and healthcare application is regulated. There are basically safety standards. And then another thing that is very important when you match the, you know, the, the virtual reality into something that has to then produce the, as, a, as a manufactured element uh, is basically taking into account all the regulation. As I said, distinguishing between entertainment uh, is very nice uh, seeing something in a video displayed with a lot of, you know, gadget and those kind of things. But uh, uh, bringing those elements uh, into a real product that then could be sustained in long terms and could be, you know, compliant with rules uh, and regulation, and especially the safety regulations are very, very stringent. That is a is a big challenge. So anything has be, I mean, all, every every system that has to do with, uh, you know, uh, AR in, in in VR should be. Uh, thought in a way that if deployed in the field, uh, uh, the elements that are safety relevant are taken into account. And those things are called functional safety. There is a technical terms that define those elements. Yeah, it's, it's, it, with safety, it's like, uh, it, that's why often we, with like general consumer robots that are like capable of like, I don't know, cleaning your kitchen, doing things. It well, uh, for other reasons as well, but safety being a concern, like capability of it, like even if it's like accidental. Um, I know, like even with a lot of um, robotic arm manufacturers, they don't specifically make end effectors, which is like the gripper, um, because like you know, if you're if you work in a factory and you want to make a robot chop up a fish, you got to put a knife on the end of the robot to chop up the fish. But like. If it cuts somebody, like they're trying to eliminate the liability, you know, there's a ton of safety things um, installed in those. Uh, but like, you know, people always find a way to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> another question. To circumvent those product points. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Or an yeah. accident can happen. So, yeah. So I have a far out question and hypothetical. Um, what about brain interfaces? Ooh, brain interfaces. <laughs> That's uh, well. So yeah, no, we don't have Gabe Newell on stage, um, unfortunately. Uh, so um, brain interfaces are pretty a pretty interesting avenue of like again meshing human and machine into that, and um, I think they're still fairly well. I mean, there's like, um, what are those, the haptic, like the, the head mounted, like electro, they the detect, DVDs. yeah, yeah. So there's that, which is like easy and safe to implement. I mean, obviously there's like surgical ones that are mostly for fit, like paralyzed people, people who have like some um, difficulties with movement or have injury. Um, and that's like promising. Uh, but I think a lot of people they look at like sci-fi stories which is great it's inspiring it's great um but the realistic state of robotics is takes longer to develop things and they're usually applied to specific uh solutions that like so medical like having slight like sensation back in an arm or a leg or something that's the goal when you know in, in sci-fi land people are like i want to like control my mouse with my brain that type of thing so it and and often i mean it's not it's no no qualm to anybody that that um is interested in that way it's it keeps people um excited but um what happens is that the general public get confused about how to interact or talk about or like work with robots because you know you there's a lot of hype people that are like yeah this robot's smart it's genius it can do everything and then there's like the roboticists that are like well yeah it's good but <laughs> it's it has limitations um so and and it, if you're selling robots by telling people that it can do everything, then everyone's happy and your investors are happy. But um, realistically, products are made like you know to usually solve. I, when people talk about general purpose robots, I'm usually like just find a robot to solve specific tasks at the moment um, or specific market uh, because that's the the thing that will you know hit and be more effective than just trying to do general purpose. I don't know if. You guys want to add to that? I'm sure you guys have opinions on that a little bit, but well, in, in academia, how do you see? <laughs> yeah. So there is definitely research on the ability to use EGGs and other methods of uh, 
other methods to control systems inside of AR and VR uh, for robotics. There was a, a research project that we were having on campus where they were trying to use brainwaves to control uh, a mobile-based robot. Um, and while it is a possibility, we get concerns at um, interference from other devices. You get um, concerns about how widespread and to the to the mentions before, what isn't just novel, what is actually going to be helpful outside of this? Why are we expanding into this research area? Um, what can we utilize this? And when you're talking about the application of robotics, you're looking into the medical field, you're looking into construction, and if you have to rely on such a, a, a variable method, you would offer something that's more stable. Yeah, and to, to the point too, it's, it's always interesting. Um, I think a lot of people when they're developing products and AR, VR, software, hardware. Um, <laughs> so there's the dream client, there's the dream market and like kind of focus, which is, you know, again, good to have. But then when you really hit the ground in the reality of the situation, it's like totally different. So like earlier I saw a talk um, about uh, basically a like head mountain display for um, people to, you can circle like, hey, put a screw, uh, you don't have to screw this thing in the girder up here and then people in the workplace can like say, okay, they can circle things remotely and, and, and it's a really cool interactive thing. It's like, oh yeah, that's useful. It's easy to be like, that's useful. But in like real practice, <laughs> if you gave that to like, you know, your standard union shop that has like guys that are like 60 year old, they, they know everything and then a new person comes along and they're like, look at this guy, he has a thousand dollar headset, he doesn't know how to screw in this thing and the light bulb in the sky, you know, and, and um, it, there's that whole, like, there's a whole stigma around it, there's a whole kind of uh, social workplace issue, which, it, you know, it might, over time, people say, oh, no, don't worry, it's a thing, but at the same time, it, while that's the dream demo um, of, like, being, like, hey, circle this thing, like, how, like, is that going to be utilized, like, 10 times daily, once daily, 100 times daily, is that, like, like is that does it have staying power as a technology and as a as a really useful tool um and not to say it's not like has has its place and it can be useful but like i think a lot of people are selling like you know even robots as, as well you know they're selling oh this is this dream thing um and in reality it's you know <laughs> it has it has this market it's okay but uh, i don't know it's <laughs> it's a kind of tricky to uh yeah, yeah we, we do see a little bit of market with, uh, for example, people with disabilities uh, that might be, you know, um, you know, so, so, somewhat uh, um, facilitated in their interaction, in a day-to-day -day interaction is a very a unique user interface, but uh, the market from a return on investment is very specific. So there are very specific niche market that this particular interface is going to be used. Uh, if we think about the general, say, applications, uh, specific applications that are, you know, outside the people with disabilities, uh, you might hit some, you know, uh, again, regulation or some obstacle that are you know, re related to the usage of those interfaces. Are those interfaces, you know, doing something for my health? Are those interfaces uh, specifically designed for me? Uh, what happens if my mouse is taking control of my brain? I'm making an example. So that's, that's uh, you don't want that the mouse is controlling your brain so that it works the other way around. So the point is uh, basically, um, you know, understanding and identifying the specific market uh, in which this particular uh, interface is operating uh, without dreaming that uh, everyone is going to use this particular thing just because it's cool that that is gonna it's not gonna work in our at least from what we see in, in in terms of market yeah yeah I know like like happily like I'm sure you're not going around and be like hey we're the next mouse we're replacing the mouse like you have markets it's very useful and there's amazing stuff you can do with your product but it's just like a lot, i think sometimes it gets lost people are like this is the new especially in there's a lot of like media headlines that will get popped up like this is this you know robot's going to do this thing or this new technology is going to be a huge disruptor disruptor this and that and it's like well that's nice but um realistically it has a market it has a great space and it's it's very it's a useful thing and i don't know if you want to <laughs> well I think it's very important to try and design um, a system such that it facilitates the transition and is useful. 
um, to people uh, rather than trying to create an entirely new paradigm and tell them that they have to change their workflow. So what we've done with our uh, 3D mouse or haptic robot is made it so that you can attach different types of tools to the end of it. And one of the visions that we see, if these are gonna actually be used in people's homes in the near future, is that we want you to be able to take a 2D mouse, use that for 90% of your interaction, and then when you have that 10%, 5% of the time as a 3D artist, where you might benefit from directly editing a point cloud or sculpting a character's face or putting on makeup or you know editing a part that you are using as an engineer, then you can snap in and use that 3D mouse in that capacity. Um, so it's really about facilitating the transition and adoption of technology, rather than just trying to create this paradigm and expect everybody to fit into that mold. Exactly, that's that's awesome. So any other question, audience questions, comments to, well, we're almost at time, so we can, we can chat some more, but I wanna, Thank all of our. Oh, are you? <laughs> I have a question. Oh, okay, okay, sure, sure. And I know nothing about robotics, so please, this might be a little Sorry. bit elementary, but I guess what products or innovations truly, truly excite you right now, whether they're currently prevalent in the industry or up and coming, or what products or innovations truly scare you that might be coming to society? <laughs> well, the answer, well, for me and probably some other people, the answer for both is like chat GPT. Um, it's like exciting and scary. Um, and just like how AI, like it has, it's great, powerful thing, um, but like it's a great, powerful thing. <laughs> like take care of it. Um, so yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, definitely that is, uh, I mean, we, we, we see that there's a sort of revolution, I would say right now. Um, but today is most of uh, of an instrument uh, instead of being a solution so if you use that uh, as a tool uh, it's probably going to be very useful if you pretend that these things uh, is becoming you know something that is uh, your substitute or your twin that is probably not a good use i mean beside all the possible evil things that could happen uh, Technically, is something that will will change a lot. Uh, at least uh, from our perspective, the you know the ability of interact with the machine, the ability of interacting with uh, a system that is virtual, the ability of interacting with uh, uh, developing things, uh, because it's definitely good help. Uh, but as I said, uh, it should be used as a tool, not like uh, you know a substitute of uh, of a people or a human being. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and also just to mention too, like with robotics, like I think a lot of times, like as engineers and people designing things, we try to design robots like that are easily usable by people. Uh, but like also society, ha there has to be like a kind of card place in society for that. And the same thing goes with like avatars and 3D like interactions and like it's still kind of, still very new like let's be honest is even though this conference has been going on for years now it's like this is still very new technology and and how we interact so people don't know how to interact with like a robot um i always use the example of like with um with a robot in best buy like it's the idea is like okay it tells you a map it tells you about the sales and like it's that's its function but in reality people going up to it being like how old are you what do you think about the president like say a bad word you know some crazy stuff which is fun like because people want to like break it and have fun with it but then if the robot says like this very muted like no comment response then they're like oh this is dumb this is just a fixture which and no company wants a robot saying bad stuff generally right now so it's a conundrum where like um people don't know where robots like can be placed i mean in industrial settings it's like a tool and it's more and it's more clear but social robots are it's a little bit yeah any other last comments from the panel no thank you very much for having yeah. us yeah thank you yeah, thank everybody. you so much thank you so Thanks much for showing up ending friday showing up. <laughs> yeah thank okay. you guys cool. good stuff thanks